Hello, and welcome back to Introducing Persistence. This lesson is going to be great. We're going to learn how to write files to the disk as we finish the Save String to File method. This is challenging material, but we'll explain everything as we go along. So let's get started. To write a string to a file, we need to use two Java classes, File Writer and Buffered Writer. The File Writer class is fairly simple. It has a constructor that takes the name of the file to be written as an argument. Now we could use just the File Writer to write our file. However, the File Writer only writes one character at a time, so it's very inefficient. To fix this, we use a little Java magic. We connect the File Writer object to a Buffered Writer object. This automatically buffers the output, which is a fancy way of saying that the data is written to the disk in large chunks and is much more efficient. The nice thing about this is that it all happens behind the scenes. All we need to do is use the Buffered Writer object and the rest is automatic. This will be clearer when we see the code, which is what we'll do now. Remember that we left off the last lesson with a completed test method for the save string to file method and with an auto-generated My Utilities class with the two empty methods. So let's start coding the save string to file method. Notice that Eclipse already knew that these methods were static methods by the way that we called them from the test method. We'll start by double clicking to give ourselves some room. Then we'll import the Java I.O. packages that we need. Then we'll change this variable called string that Eclipse created to make it clear what that does. And that's the file name. Remember we've got the two the two parameters. First one's the file name and then the second one is the actual string that we're saving. Okay, now we're ready to actually start typing the method. Now we're going to take this a little bit slow. This method is not very long, but it's a little complicated, so we'll be explaining as we go. First line is boolean saved equals false. This is just going to be the variable that's going to return the result of the method, either true or false. Then we're going to create our buffered writer object, but we're just going to set it equal to null for now. And remember the buffered writer object is the one that wraps around the file writer that automatically provides the better performance by buffering the output. We're going to enter the method a little differently. Instead of typing it sequentially, we're going to work on it from the outside working our way in. So now we'll enter in our try catch block as follows. Okay, so we start with a try, put in the curly braces, and now we're going to set our BW object equal to new buffered writer, and inside the parentheses for new buffered writer, we're going to create the new file writer object, file name. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. Then that's our try block. Now we do our catch block, and we're going to catch the I.O. exception, which is what the method above throws, and we'll talk about that more. And we're just going to do a print stack trace, just like we did in lesson one. And then at the end we do return save, where we're returning our uh, result of the method. Now this method isn't done yet. We haven't actually written anything to our file. But let's go over what we have so far. Now here in our try block, we're setting our buffered writer object to a new buffered writer, and then as the argument for the new buffered writer, we're actually creating a new file writer object, and then the argument for that is our file name that we've passed in. Now, we could have done this instead. I'm going to use the control slash to comment this out. We could have said file file writer fw equals new file writer file name and then bw equals new 
buffered writer fw. This would have produced exactly the same results. However, in this method, we will never need to work with the file writer directly. We only need to use the buffered writer object bw. The bw object will work with the file writer object automatically behind the scenes. So by nesting the file writer constructor, as we did up here, inside the buffered writer constructor, we have one less variable to declare and keep track of, and our code is clearer. This type of syntax is very common in Java when you don't need a reference to an object. Next, we'll use Control Z in Eclipse to undo what we've just typed. I'm going to go Control Z a few times, and we're going to, by magic, go back to what we had. Now we're back to where we were. If you haven't already discovered it, Control Z is the uh, Eclipse Editor undo, and it can be very handy at times. Now the catch block is very simple. We're not really trying to do any error processing, but we are going to just print out the stack trace from the exception. Now we knew that this method up here can throw an I.O. exception, and we'll talk about that more a little bit later in the lesson. Then here at the end, outside the try catch block, we're returning the saved variable that we set up here. Now notice we haven't set the save to true anywhere because we haven't actually done our write yet. So now let's get going on that part. Now comes the tricky part of this method. We're going to go inside our try block after we've set our uh, buffered writer object and we're going to nest a second try block as follows. So we move inside the try block and we put in another try block and then we go bw write save string. So this is where we're actually writing out the string. Then we're going to say set our saved equals true because at this point we're successful. Now we're going to add a finally block and in the finally block we just put one line of code bw.close. We'll save our work and then I'm just going to clean this up so it fits on the screen and save again. So in this method we're nesting a second try block, try and finally, inside this first try block. Now why are we doing this? The answer has to do with this bw-close method. When we're working with files, we need to be sure to close them. If a file is left open, it can cause locking or other serious problems in the operating system. As we discussed in Lesson 1, the best way to make sure that a statement gets run is to put it inside of a finally block. A finally block gets run whether or not there's an error. But here's the problem. The close method itself is risky, so it needs to be inside a try block. But in a try catch finally block, the finally block, of course, is outside the try block. So what do we do? Well, the solution is, as we see here, is to use two try catch blocks, one inside the other. The outer try catch block contains the inner finally block. So even though the close method is inside a finally block, it's also inside a try block. So it's protected if it throws an exception. So if we get an exception up in this line of code, this whole try and finally block will be skipped which is okay because that means that the buffered writer object was never open. The file was never opened. If we get an exception in this line of code where we're actually writing out the string, then this finally block is guaranteed to be executed so we know that our you know, buffered writer object will close and it'll close the file. Once we understand the nested try catch blocks, the rest of this method is very easy to follow. Inside the inner try block, we execute 
the bwwrite method, which actually writes the string to the file. Then we set our save value equals true, because at this point we know we're successful. Now you may be asking, where is the catch block? The answer is that since this is nested inside this try catch block, we don't need a catch block for the inner try block. The outer catch block will catch our exceptions. We can just add a finally block, which is where we put the BW close. So we don't need a catch block on the inner try, because we've got the outer catch block there. Now if you like, you can prove this to yourself using the Eclipse scrapbook. Just modify the lesson 1 divide by 0 example to do the division in an inner try block and add an inner finally block. Try it with both a legal and illegal division and you will see that the finally block always executes. If you need some help with this, there are some examples you can try in the tutorial companion guide. Now how do we know that a method or constructor is risky and needs to go into a try block? Well let's try an example to find out. Give ourselves some room. We're going to create a new method. We'll just call it test stuff. We're going to delete it as soon as we're done here in a minute. And then we're going to try to create a new file writer object. And we'll also try a method on it. Now notice the, the Eclipse compiler tells us we have a problem. If we hover on the problem, we can see it says unhandled exception type IO exception. If we click on the constructor, bring this back to normal size, and open up the Java doc window, we can see in the Java doc that it says that this constructor throws an IO exception. So the writers of this class decided that using this constructor was risky and decided to throw an I.O. exception if something went wrong. Now by doing this, they force any method that uses this constructor to do one of two things. First, put it in a try-catch block, like we did, or second, have the calling method throw an exception as well. So let's try that. Maximize this again. If we add throws IO exception to our method, now our compiler problems disappear. The second approach of adding throws IO exception basically just passes this problem one level up. So now any method that calls our test stuff method would have to deal with this exception either by putting it in a try catch block or by again throwing the IO exception. So now we'll delete this method and save our file again. At this point we've written our save string to file method. In the next lesson we'll write our get string from file method and then test both of these methods using our JUnit test class. This is the end of lesson four. I'm Mark Dexter saying so long for now.